an issue that I think has been lurking out there for two or three weeks and cast it specifically in national security terms. You already are the oldest president in history, and some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr. Uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all. Mr. Truitt and I, and I want you to know that also, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> I still have time, I might add, Mr. Truitt, I might add that uh, <clears throat> it was Seneca or it was Cicero, I don't know which, that said, if it was not for the elders correcting the mistakes of the young, there would be no state. Mr. President, I'd like to head for the fence and try to catch that one before it goes over, but... So, um, did everybody watch that? Did everybody see that? Oh, oh hang on. There we are. Did everybody see that? Um, so I'm going to introduce Michael. Michael, tell us a bit about that. I think that's a fantastic example of uh, classical humor and rhetoric being used to great effect. Um, and uh, what did you think? Talk us through that. So hi, everybody. You, you want me to talk you through it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, hi. I mean, hi, everybody from New York, central New York, not with the big buildings, but we got the cows and the chickens out here around us. Um, so that is one of the most famous political exchanges in certainly in American electoral history, right? It is a sort of jujitsu, verbal jujitsu. Uh, and it is a, a perfect use of humor when you're on the attack. So I'm actually developing a couple of courses based on the art of humor right now. And we've done a lot about this. You're all speech writers, so you know this. If you are writing a speech for somebody to give, you can start off with a joke, right? But that's when you have the spotlight and uh, you've been handed the spotlight and you wanna win the audience's attention. You wanna sell them a product. You wanna sell them yourself, whatever it is you want. But the Reagan thing was different, right? Could you see that? He was thrust into the spotlight with this sort of potentially damaging charge. And he was trying to get out of it as fast as he could. He doesn't have any factual way of countering the fact that he's the oldest president of all time. So he makes the audience laugh. And if you watch the exchange, it's fascinating. Moderator laughs, his opponent, laugh, Mondale laughs, Reagan smiles ironically. You can hear the whole audience laughing and the whole question just fizzles away. And then at the very last second, Reagan resets the room seriously again by invoking Cicero and Seneca. He says, I don't know which it was. For, the, uh, for that point, I myself, I'm a professor of classics. I don't know who said that, if either of them said that. It may not even be true that they said that, but he signals to the audience that he knows uh, serious classical literature. He's an educated person, even though he's an actor by profession. And the audience just it glides on uh, you know, the, the allegation just glides on past and Reagan went on to win, as you know. I, it's a masterpiece. It's a masterpiece of humor for anybody in the public in the public sphere. OK, well, um, so, Michael, you've written this book. Um, is, is this one of the techniques that uh, Cicero or Quintilian recommended? Is it something you could. It was so, part of that. Yes and no. Uh, so the book, uh, I can tell you a little bit about it. I've translated two treatises, the two classic treatises on the art of humor in public life. So the telling jokes for social advantage or political advantage. It's not just to stand up like a stand up comedian and tell jokes and make people smile. It's how to win friends and influence people with humor. And so they definitely do. Both of them include these kind of jokes, but they aren't as um, clear about the two different styles of joking uh, that I just articulated for you. I just say jokes when you um, when you are offered the spotlight or you take the spotlight willingly, or jokes when you are thrust in the spotlight and you're trying to get out as fast as you can. But there's uh, Quintilian's very first example in the book here is a, uh, an example of that. He gives you, you mind if I read it to you? It's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. 
He says, let me just find this. If anybody has the book, it is uh, on page 151. But uh, Quintilian was a professor like me. Cicero was the president of ancient Rome. He was a prime minister. So he was what they call the man in the arena, the guy who would actually tell a joke at a murder trial. Quintilian was a dude like me. Who was, he would watch what other people, the heroes did and collect them and write textbooks. And he says, some people say that humor is no big deal. He says, but I think humor is massively effective. And he says, this is to start translating on page 151. The case of those teenagers in Tarentum proves it. So Tarentum's a city in the south of Italy. At a dinner party, they'd said a, a lot of really nasty things about King Pyrrhus when they were brought in to explain themselves. And there was no denying or defending it. They escaped with a laugh and a well-timed joke. So the king, I guess, said, what do you have to say for yourselves? And one of them quipped, no, nah, man, if we hadn't run out of booze, we would have killed you. <laughs> and it says that witticism melted away all the hard feelings over the charge. So that line plays great in the U.S. You know, your mileage may vary and whatever your home uh, idiom is. But in other words, these guys were busted drinking and bad mouthing the king. And what did they do? They said, look, you know, with the joke, they acknowledge everybody says stupid things when they're drinking. Everybody takes it too far. And the king got the giggles and it's an involuntary reflex. This is fascinating. So laughter is involuntary. You know this. Uh, and it automatically sort of whatever's happened chemically or blood, blood pressure wise, blood pressure wise, if you give someone the giggles, they side with you automatically. So the king just let them go. It's what happened with Reagan and Mondale. We've seen some of this happen in other countries in recent years. I mean, not in the United States. It could never happen here, but maybe in other countries where politicians tell jokes of that style. Okay. So, so as um, you know, we don't get to meet classics professors very often. Um, do do um, uh, any of you, have any of your students gone into politics or, 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 or into these kind of communication roles? Do, do you feel that classics still prepares people for um, uh, public life? So this is gonna be a, a big distinction, I think, between the UK and the US. My sense is that in the UK classics, it's still a traditional path to national electoral politics. Is that, I mean, it would appear to be the case with Boris Johnson, but yeah, not just Boris Johnson. I mean, it's, uh, but that has never really been the case in the United States. It hasn't been true, uh, if ever, in a very long time here. Uh, not since, you know, the only people who went to university studied Greek and Latin. So uh, that's a longer answer to say my own students haven't really done this. Um, but I do have family members that are involved in politics. Uh, and so, you know, behind the scenes, we talk about some of these things. Um, the closest we've gotten, uh, and this would be of interest to you, the closest we've gotten to this in the United States in recent years was Barack Obama's speechwriter, at least in his first term. I forget the guy's name. He was very young. Favreau, I, Favreau, John Favreau. I think it might be John Favreau, not the Hollywood director, but the other John Favreau. And he was all of about 24, 25 years old, something like this, clearly had studied classical rhetoric. And so when Barack Obama burst on the scene with these soaring speeches that were winning the hearts of everybody, even his worst opponents, because this is a pretty good speech, it was obvious that he was channeling Cicero uh, and had studied Cicero and was trying to bring those models into our national politics, which is very rare. Um, I think my sense is it's more common, the, the sort of high flown rhetoric is much more common in the United, in the UK than it is in the United States. Um, well, I don't know what other people would say, but, but I, I would say that it's a myth on both, both countries. The British think the Americans do it and the Americans think the British do it. Oh, is that right? Really? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, if you, if anybody remembers George W. Bush, he was not a Ciceronian in his rhetoric. That was part of his persona. The guy would say, oh, I just sort of fell off of the back of a pickup truck or something. And he, he, he did the plain style to give the impression that he had not gone to Yale and studied elite subjects like everybody else. Uh, and so that's a very popular approach in the United States. But then when Obama came along, the guy was unabashed in using the classical techniques. You and I were emailing a little bit about you know, the alliteration the ascenditon. I, I don't know if everybody knows these technical terms. You, you absolutely must if you don't. I assume you probably do, but um, and just sort of transporting everybody. Donald Trump, I would say, had a different style again altogether. But but it is um, you know you, you you teach at Cornell University, which is a prestigious university. 
is um, rhetoric part of the, you know, in a, I know the classics department, but is there also a rhetoric department? Because we understand that American universities still still sort of take rhetoric seriously. Yeah, I'm not sure who told you that. Uh, <laughs> I might cancel my subscription to that magazine. No, uh, there are a couple of places that have a department of rhetoric, which is itself just a fancy name for the English department. Uh, I don't know that we offer courses in speech writing and to the extent at, at the entire university anywhere, um, much more we get sort of writing, public writing or academic writing. But the idea that you would write a speech and deliver it um, that sort of uh, technique can be taught in the high schools here, but I think it's kind of rare at universities. And then people get it through Toastmasters if they graduate and they want to go on and continue their public speaking. Uh, there tend to be these private institutions to help with that. Okay, okay. So, so um, what, what kind of people come to, is classic still flourishing in your university? What, what do your colleagues, um, how do they view the classics department? Well, there's a culture war and it's a full blown hot war here in the United States right now. If you want some entertainment, I invite you to follow it. Uh, so what the classics department is, is very much up for grabs. It's not at all clear how it's going to end. Um, there are some very traditional models where uh, it's uh, very influenced by the UK model of uh, a lot of Greek, a lot of Latin, um, very little archaeology or numismatics or inscriptions or anything, but just mastery of the languages. There are other people that think mastery of everything but the languages is important. Um, but overall, the, I think the numbers of students taking classics are, at Cornell, they're unchanged over many years. We have the same tiny department we've always had. And it sort of, it attracts the kind of people that are interested in this sort of thing, precisely because it's not really, um, what's the word? Uh, it doesn't lead to a career, a defined career in any particular way, even though all of our graduates go on to do well, often with the written word in some capacity. Okay, okay. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, so, so tell us a bit about, you know, Cicero. What, what, yep. What, 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 um... I should quiz the audience here. If I were to ask you all folks, because your award is the Cicero Award, how long ago did Cicero live? Does anybody have the slightest idea? Well, we must ask Lech here because he's won three. Lech, are you there? Lech, Lech has won three Cicero awards yesterday. So, uh... well, I hope. <laughs> Just yesterday. All right. Well, wow. that's, that's impressive. Two, two, two and a half, Brian. But thank right. you. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I, you know what? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just um, put it out there and say I haven't got a clue. Um, I uh, he was contemporary of. Caesar, wasn't he? So yeah. can't have been much before Christ. Um, yeah. So, um, but I, I'm not going to not going to go. But I don't know, fifty BC. Um, at very a guess. good, very good, very very good. That's well, that's just that's just a guess. There you go. Yeah, well, you could leave off the last part about the guess. I was impressed. That's great. Ah, yeah. So good. Cicero, Cicero was born uh, 106 BC or BCE, as he prefer. They say before Christ. <laughs> And he was assassinated in 43 BCE, the year after Julius Caesar was killed. And you say, well, who cares? He's some old guy. Cicero was probably the most inspiring individual of the ancient world, unless you choose Jesus or something like that, uh, who was off in a far part of the Roman Empire a few decades later. But Cicero was the, uh, he was president of ancient Rome, more or less. In ancient Rome, they called the president the consul. And Rome had two consuls every year instead of you know, one and a vice consul every four years, which is our system here. But um, he was uh, a guy who made it all the way to the top against all the odds. And he did it all on the gift of his rhetoric, on his soaring speeches, uh, both in the law courts first and in the electoral speeches. And so he was this guy from the provinces, a little bumpkin town called Arpino, Italy. I've been there. And the only thing it's famous for now is they have a soap factory which is kind of cool because it, when I was last there, they were dumping all the suds into the little local river. So the river is, looks like a huge washing machine and bubbles everywhere. Uh, and so this guy makes it all the way to Rome and rises to the very tip top of politics. And in the year that he was president, so to speak, he was 43 years old, uh, he thwarted a coup attempt on Rome. And the Romans were so afraid that they were all going to be, you know, murdered in the sleep that they hailed him as a new founder of the city and this great, wonderful person. 
Uh, but the thing he did was he wound up putting these um, four guys on, uh, he had them executed without a trial because he says, we don't have time for a trial. We know they're guilty. And so he went ahead and did it. And that came back to haunt him many years later. But his whole career, he wrote these speeches. They're models of rhetoric. So that'd be of interest to you. But he also wrote philosophy in his exile and retirement period. And he had a, a fantastic command of Greek. So he, if you read his books, it's not just his own ideas. It's all the best ideas of Greek philosophy filtered down into familiar words in Latin. Uh, and then, you know, some of it's the practices he used out in the courts and some of the, um, you know, the theoretical ideas from the Greeks. But if uh, you know the word morality, for example, Cicero coined that word, it's kind of cool. He said, I need a word to translate this Greek word ethics. What am I going to use? How about morals? That works. And uh, we know the book, in fact, where he did all these things. So um, he's dropped down the memory hole. I don't know. It's amazing, but Cicero, everybody knows Julius Caesar was a pretty nasty guy. Uh, and you'll see a statue of him if you go to Rome today, but you don't see the Cicero statue. It's kind of a shame. But, but I've been doing a lot of research into Cicero over the last year, and he basically was the, the educational curriculum until about the end of the 19th century. That's it. So yes, uh, the, Cicero was killed in 43, instantly became a school classic. Uh, now, there was no public school in ancient Rome. So if you wanted your son, it was usually sons, although sometimes some daughters, to get an education, you would have them read the best models of speech writing, because the whole society was built on the persuasive word, the persuasive speech. And so people say, well, who's the best? Well, this guy Cicero was the best. So we're going to study his speeches. And his speeches coincide with this really dramatic, exciting time period of the downfall of the Roman Empire. So when Cicero... Uh, 43, he was killed. Within 20 years, Rome had converted to this autocracy, the Roman Empire, uh, which lasted for 500 years in the West. And so Cicero was sort of the last holdout, this sort of martyr figure for Republican ideals. Um, and he was the bread and butter of all rhetorical training up until, as you said, just about 100 years ago. Um, what does happen in the Renaissance is you get, like anything else, you get fanatics. And you get these people who say, well, if Cicero is the best model. We shouldn't read anything else. So if Cicero never used this word, I'm never going to use this word. And so you got a bunch of Christians trying to describe the Bible using Cicero's words, but Cicero didn't use, he doesn't say things like Holy Spirit. So they have to, they get these kind of ridiculous fanatical ways of trying to handle a new society with his language and speech. Um, so he, yeah, why did he go out of fashion? That's a good question, but there's probably a lot of reasons. Um, because the other thing, I'm, I'm quite surprised that, uh, you know, the classics is association, associated by sort of something for elite gentlemen. Um, and, uh, you know, which is a sort of luxury, um, which you can study. Um, and it's all sort of rather vain and, 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 um, and, and, and superfluous and frivolous sort of thing. But actually, uh, from my, my understanding, it is ret learning rhetoric is to learn how to be um, a politician, how to be a leader, and how to persuade people, and how to govern people. And um, the point about um, the Renaissance was that everybody did, did Latin for the for the first five years, and then they did a, a year of uh, rhetoric, and then they went on to be um, uh, clergy, lawyers, politicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, th this enabled the grammar school boys to be very socially mobile. You know, these, these people with no background could go on to be leading people in Elizabethan courts and poets and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then so Thomas Hobbes comes along and says, this is all too divisive. We've had a civil war. We can't have these people having their own opinions. We've got to be governed by an aristocracy um, that, 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 that has absolute power. Um, and so classics um, is, sort of, you know, so this rhetoric stuff is buried. Um, and, and, and it's, it, you know, now we, we sort of, it, it is, a, a, understood by people like Boris Johnson, but not by everybody else. But one of the problems of, you can't have social mobility unless you have young people who can communicate. Um, so how, how do we get to the stage where classics is, is sort of looked down upon as, as something that is sort of so out of date and so irrelevant? Well, it sounds like we classics professors are failing you pretty bad on that point. We need to find ways to show people why it does everything you just said. I'd agree with all that. It's the basis of communication. Uh, I mean, it's not just that. There's a lot of other stuff, too. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, education traditionally was for a very select group of people, right? Uh, and it's only been extremely recently that it's been democratized to extent, an extent where anybody can come in and do this stuff. Um, and so it is true that if, uh, especially now with the, the cost of tuition going so sky high here in the United States, a lot of people say, we're not going to pay that college tuition if you're not going to study something practical with a defined career outcome. So I would like to see us in classics re-embrace the idea that um, classics is fantastic from, for public speaking of all kinds. You, you quite right. We said the clergy, politicians, lawyers, but what about sales? Right. Uh, yeah. What about marketing of all kinds? Anybody who needs to sell an idea or sell a person, uh, sell something can benefit from this stuff. Uh, the other thing is it's sort of uh, most of the philosophies of the world are already represented in the ancient world, too. So it's an easy way to sort of dip a toe in all these different um, subjects without, you know, getting hyper specialized in any of them. So there are different fixes that we're trying to uh, come up with to make it clear what it is we're trying to teach people here, but I'm not sure we've been all that successful at it. Okay. So, so the other half of this book, this, this is two, um, an extract from two books, De Oratore and Institute Orat um, I can't remember the, 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 um, Institutio Oratoria. Um, the other chap is Quintilian. Now, who is Quintilian? Quintilian was a professor like me. So Cicero, president. Quintilian, guy like me, grew up in Spain and his entire career, he studied the greatest politicians in the Roman Empire. And at the end, he had the world's first endowed chair of Latin literature in Rome. So they already had this kind of stuff in the early Roman Empire. He was a professor and he said, I'm going to write a textbook synthesizing everything I've learned. So Cicero's book, you just mentioned De Oratore, which means on the orator. And Quintilian's textbook, uh, Institutio Oratore, they both mean basically educating an orator. They are two models of speech writing, and they're meant to be comprehensive textbooks for the entire art. Um, and this is, uh, the, either of these things would be great for anybody interested in the, the craft of speech writing, but they both include uh, a module on humor. So Cicero's module on humor was all based partly on Greek philosophy and his own experience in electoral politics. Quintilian had no experience in electoral politics, so he drew on a larger range of sources, including some of Cicero's own quips, which had been gathered up separately and published as a book. Now that book is lost, but he's got maybe five, six, seven of them. Quintilian quotes those. And what's also interesting is he quotes a number of jokes told by Augustus, who was Rome's first emperor. So Cicero lived in a time, the Roman Republic, where competitive speech could really bring you big rewards, right? You could become president. You could uh, win a trial uh, fairly or unfairly, but you could still win it that way. When you get to Augustus and as time goes on, it becomes more and more authoritarian in the Roman Empire. And so it's not a good idea necessarily to be outspoken. Uh, it's not clear that speaking persuasively can actually change the outcome of an election or change the outcome of a trial. Uh, so they're in very, very different societies here. I was doing an interview about the book and I said, in a way it's uh, Cicero's jokes are the kind of jokes that we had before everything was recorded on social media. And Quintilian's jokes are better suited for a time period when everything is recorded. And in seven years time, any of this could surface on Instagram or Twitter and suddenly, you know, the mob forms. Uh, so he has to be much more circumspect in everything he says. Okay, and, and, and is it a sort of readable text? You know, I, I saw you can get, get for about 20 pounds the institutes of oratory translated from a Victorian, you know, updated translation. Is it something that's that's sort of accessible? You know, because I've, I've read some Cicero and it's extremely readable and ex accessible. It, it is Quintilian or is it, is it sort of a bit too, what would you say? It's a good question because Cicero's text is a dialogue. Uh, I compared it to a movie script, right? So he, he has these ideas and he distributes them among, among several different characters and each has a little personality and they make jokes here and there. Quintilian's is just a straight textbook. Uh, and so when I read most of it, my eyes start to glaze over and I say, I'm not so sure. Uh, if you were gonna reprint it today, I would do it with, you'd reformat the whole thing with bullet points or call out boxes to make it a little more interesting. But otherwise it's just sort of a long list of different techniques. And in fact, in the translation, there was one part here 
I, I don't know that I could find it right now, but Quintilian is naming about 25 different, what they call figures of speech. These are the technical terms for uh, asyndeton, alliteration, epanalepsis, all these crazy things. I didn't even translate them. I just said, oh, it works this way with all of them. Uh, so you have to know a lot to get ahead. That said, you could learn a lot from Quintilian on how to write a speech or how to give a speech. Okay. Um, now, one of the ways, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, became a corporate speechwriter and after a year, my contract ended and then, and then I sort of advertised in a satirical magazine. And, and most of my business was doing wedding speeches. And, you know, when you start off, you don't know what to do in a wedding speech. You just sort of think, well, I'll, I'll just make shorter sentences and stuff like that than what they would put. But after a while, I realized that uh, what you wanted to do was uh, collect um, jokes about particular vices, you know, like, um, is, is he drinking too much? Does he gamble too much? Does he, um, uh, uh, you know, he, does he not reach into his pocket when there's a, you know, um, there's a round of drinks? Um, does he like cars? How does he dress? All, all this kind of stuff. And then I collected a commonplace book um, of uh, jokes about all these different um, uh, foibles of, of the, the groom, you know, and then what I'd do is, is I'd interview the, uh, the, the the best man and say, you know, what 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 characteristics sort of fit the, the pattern with this, and um, and they'd tell me, and then I'd basically get my uh, jokes about gambling or jokes about um, uh, drinking too much, and th and then I'd put them in the speech, and and the thing is, is that pe people think that by telling stories, true stories about friends, that they might be some way humorous. But people can't relate to them, you know. The, the, you know, student life is, is so different from from the perspective when you're an old man, isn't it? You know, you can't really understand how students live today. But but that that sort of seems to me the the way to do humour is is to um, make it universal from the particular. Do you know what I mean, is, is that something that is that come out in in how to tell a joke? So it doesn't. Um, it it does. Come, what you say is ingenious. The way you did it, um, and it's something I talk about in these courses I'm teaching. So if you want to make an effective joke in a setting like that, uh, what you did it sounds like is perfect. Uh, you know the risk of telling a bad joke at a my rehearsal dinner or something. <laughs> when you think about the downsides of telling some mortifying story about the groom's past or the bride's past. Uh, it's a minefield. You don't want to do that. So what you do is you take a joke exactly as you did, picking up some vice, some foible, and then you make the joke as general as you possibly can. You get rid of all the identifying characteristics. Um, so it's an old insight. This goes back to Aristotle, but a lot of people have had this idea that any story you tell will elicit an identity. So if I start telling you a joke about a man and a woman, it's just natural that most of the men hearing it will identify with the man and most of the women will identify with the woman. And so this is what can make a lot of jokes backfire. Uh, so if, if I want to tell a joke and I say, instead of saying my wife, I could say my friend. Now in English, it's great, right? Because nobody, a friend could be all kinds of different things, gender neutral, no identity, no identity. But once you have a nice bland joke where all the identities, you've gotten rid of them, you fill it in with local color about the real estate or the geography. So if I were telling a joke and I were in uh, London, I wouldn't just say when I was walking down the street, but I would say as I was you know, strolling past Big Ben this morning and turning the corner around to see uh, Buckingham Palace. And people, ooh, they pick up on that because those are places that they know, they can think of these things. And that's how you, you create interest in a joke. And then you zing home whatever the foible is that you want to target in the joke. So that might work. Uh, so that works in the corporate setting very, very well. In a rehearsal dinner, it could be a little bit different or a, a wedding toast uh, because you do have the specific people there. But your basic idea of going after some vice is exactly right. So uh, the ancient I, Cicero and Quintilian, they both say the same thing, that at heart, humor is about making fun of or stigmatizing vice in a clever or acute way. Uh, right. If you stigmatize vice in a cruel way, it's not funny. It's just mean spirited. Um, but if you can find a way to sort of taunt a vice in a way that everybody can participate in the joke, that's exactly what's going to make people laugh. OK, but, um, you know, I understand that you're pl planning this sort of executive program in humor. Um, my experience from dealing with, with, with people 
is that humor is very dangerous and, and like particularly on a university campus or you know you talked about using humor in, in human university board meetings um the the the, the thing is is that um you, you know i went to toastmasters for years and i practiced my jokes and most of them fell flat and it kind of gradually dawns on you that this is a dangerous business but but you know if you work at it you know how to do it um don't you think it's extremely dangerous sort of um, in a cancel culture and and, and, I, and I know many of us write speeches you know Lech and you, you know I, I know that sort of most public speaking trainers say to business people don't tell jokes don't get anywhere near that that space um you you seem to me extremely brave to want to advocate to <laughs> telling jokes uh what, 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 what do you think you can achieve through this executive program so your intuition is exactly right. And so I trans I spent a long time thinking about how to translate this. Quintilian has a little mantra. And so I translated the following way. He says, humor is risky because wit is so close to twit. Right. That is say, you think you're being witty. The other person thinks you're twitting them or that you are a twit or you're some kind of nitwit. And you're exactly right. Telling a joke is hugely risky. But that's why the payoff can be so good. Um, and in the, uh, the course, but also in, in the book, there's plenty of these examples where if you're trying to get ahead with a joke and you have no need to tell a joke, I say, then don't necessarily tell one, right? So if you step into the spotlight, let's say you've been invited to a trade group meeting and the people are in the room are already happy to be there, they're eager to hear what you have to say, then telling a joke is probably not the best thing to do. On the other hand, if you are there to offer, you know, Mandatory training and risk assessment for a three-hour seminar. I don't know if you have these things in your office. And the, you get the sense that maybe the audience doesn't want to be there or they're not wrapped. They're not eager to hear your every word. Then you could maybe warm them up with a joke. And that could set them at ease and get them a little more on your side. And then the last case is an executive that is uh, under fire can sometimes with just the right joke get out from it. Let me give you an example. Um, it's not in the book. But I do talk about it in the course. I've talked about it on many occasions. There's a university president here in the U.S., a guy named Gordon Gee. He's been around forever, hugely successful. And about uh, 10 years ago, he was president of Ohio State University, which is the biggest university in the United States. And that year, the football coach uh, had a pretty good year. This is American football. Football coach had a pretty good year. And his compensation for the year was $4 million bucks. And Some people say, <laughs> You know, a college that's paid $4 million. It seems a little excessive for sports. And so there was a big scandal. And so the uh, president did a press conference and somebody said to the president, are you going to fire the football coach? And he took the, the microphone. And he said, look, if I'm lucky, he won't fire me. <laughs> and like that, the mask dropped just enough to suggest, which may or may not be true, who the real person in charge was in these scenarios. The university president doesn't make anything like $4 million. Uh, and it, whether it's true or not doesn't make any difference. President, that football coach was gone within a year. Gordon Gee is still president of another university somewhere. So he lived to fight another day. So that's a long-winded answer, but also a good example to show where I think executives or anybody can think about telling a joke to get ahead. Um, but also, you know, in these courses and in the book, I did draw a lot on about eight or 10 years I had as an administrator here at Cornell. So I spent um, four years as an associate dean, then uh, uh, most of a year as the dean of faculty. And then finally, I spent three years as the sort of vice provost. Uh, those are all fancy titles for roles of trying to get people to do stuff when you don't have any money to give them to do it. You have no carrots and you have no sticks. And so how do you get people to buy into something you're trying to do? And what worked for me in a lot of these cases was humor. Um, and I don't know that that would work for everyone, but it would certainly work for more people than are trying it today. Um, I went to so many cheerless, joyless meetings, and I said, we're gonna have another meeting of the benefits committee, 90 minutes to receive information on whether this stock portfolio is gonna be offered or that. I said, oh my God, please get me out of here. And so I used to tell a couple of jokes and the audience would sort of sit up and they wake up, they were happier to be there. I think a lot of us could do this, right? Okay. And, and is, is there, um, you know, in American politics, I suppose Donald Trump used a lot of humor um, yeah. in, in, in quite dangerous ways. Um, 
are there a, is there sort of still a strong tradition of humor in American politics or, or are they all sort of very wary of using it? Well, I don't think they're wary anymore. Uh, Donald Trump came out of nowhere, from my point of view, with that strategy. Now, everyone said the whole time, it's never going to work. You can't call people nicknames like you're in a schoolyard and humiliate them and win the presidency. Well, that's not true. So I think it's guaranteed that we're going to see the Trump strategy used again. I have a blog post that I'll probably never publish it's sitting on a hard drive somewhere. But I said, if you thought the Ronald Reagan joke that you showed was effective, what you need to do, all speech writers on it, have a look at the Republican primary from 2015. So this was run, I don't know if it was by Fox News, but it was run by an anchor from Fox News. So right wing news station here, Rupert Murdoch thing. And Megan Kelly, she's the anchor. Uh, this is when Donald Trump was seen as a very long shot candidate. They had no opportunity to do this. She had it all prepared. She, you know, she says, all right, we're at this debate. Donald Trump, you've been quoted calling women these terrible things. You call women disgusting pigs and cows. And I mean, the kind of thing that would make you utterly, you know, untouchable in American politics. And she goes on, you've called women this horrible thing and that horrible thing. And he interrupts and he grabs the microphone and he says, only Rosie O'Donnell. The whole audience erupted in laughter. Men, women, even the moderator on my read is trying to stifle a smile. I can't tell other people read it differently. But what happened? The room laughed so hard, he won the whole room. And then, as you know, he went on to win the presidency. So uh, it's not clear that other people could do that. So Trump, like Reagan, was an actor, right? So that is what those two of them have in common. We have other politicians here that try for humor and they're terrible. Hillary Clinton tried for humor and it was horrible. It was so wooden, it made you want to cry. Uh, you felt bad for her. I mean, you appreciate her trying, but it didn't win any sympathy. Joe Biden is pretty horrible at jokes as well. Um, so these are uh, things to watch out for, but the strategy of using humor to get out of that circumstance, as I was saying, right, where Trump is under fire. Um, you mentioned this, I think you and I mentioned this in an email, it brings up a real ethical dimension to humor, to speech writing in general, right? I mean, uh, once you know these techniques, for example, if I tell you that laughter is involuntary, which it is, laughter is infectious, which it is, and laughter wins sympathy and admiration, which it does, all this even despite yourself, how would you feel about weaponizing that to win an argument that maybe you shouldn't win? These are things you might want to think about. But I think someone like Tony Blair, you wouldn't think of as a funny guy. But if you ever saw him in interviews, how he managed to deflect so much by being likable and, and, and amusing, you know, and, and, and lighthearted. And um, how, how he sort of turn around the sort of, the, you know, the, the most sort of tough questions he can just brush aside with the lightness of touch. Very impressive. Boris Johnson, I, I don't watch him carefully, but what I see, you know, he's a classics, a big patron of classics, actually, traditionally. Um, he, he looks, from our view over here, to be quite effective in deflecting criticism as well. Uh, I don't know if that's your read uh, personally, but uh, he seems to have a, a good touch for deflecting a lot of that. I think, you know, he's got to where he has because he could do that, but I think he might be getting into a bit more deeper water at the moment. Um, you know, like things are, like accusations of financial corruption are very difficult to laugh off, really. Um, you say that Cicero and Quintilian have a bunch of examples of exactly that. In fact, I added an epilogue to the book at the very last minute, and it's called How to Take a Joke. And it's Cicero, when he was president at that year, his incoming president for the next year, sort of the consul elect, was uh, accused of electoral bribery. The guy was clearly guilty. And so Cicero's strategy, instead of addressing the facts, he began ridiculing the private beliefs of the opposing council. And it worked because this was sort of an old boys network um, where you could really, and I, I, this again, the sense I get from watching UK debates is that you can do this much more effectively there than anyone could ever do here, where you really just take the tar out of somebody uh, in a debate and then you laugh it off and you go have a beer together. <laughs> Uh, or people understand it's for show, uh, that, that would never play here, but it does seem to have played that way in ancient Rome. And so his client was uh, acquitted. I would not be surprised to see, so if, 
if uh, Johnson's under fire for corruption, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes for a joke. Yeah, oh, well, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yes. Um, but but, um, yeah, but what, what is the sort of meaning of laughter in the ancient world? You know, um, I, I remember reading Man's Search for Meaning and suggest that sort of when you can laugh at yourself and laugh at a bad experience, you kind of overcome it. It's just a psychological, sort of psychological health. Did, did, did the ancients re realize that? Uh, I don't know that they say so explicitly, but they definitely agree with that point of view. And I think a lot of us know this reflexively, right? Think about laughing and crying, both involuntary, not always involuntary. I mean, you can make them sort of happen, but laughter, and crying have always been seen as kind of a unit throughout history. Um, and the classical formulation of this, you'll see this in Renaissance art, Northern Renaissance art, is Democritus versus uh, Heraclitus. These are two Greek philosophers. And Heraclitus was the guy who looked at the world and saw that it wasn't perfect and he gets angry at it or he cries about it. And Democritus is the guy who looks at the world and he sees it's not perfect and he starts laughing at it. Uh, and again, the Greek formulation of their drama, where they have comedy and tragedy. You laugh at the one, you cry at the other. Uh, but that, that's the basis of all of this, right? The world isn't perfect. Everything breaks. Uh, we have certain things, we, human constraints we can't escape, right? You get hungry, you have to go to the bathroom. Uh, all kinds of, you start sweating when you don't want to. And so you can either get all bent out of shape about it or you can laugh about it. So um, from a psychological point of view, for me anyway, laughing at all this stuff works much better. Um, and if it doesn't work for any of you, you might try it because what do you have to lose, right? <laughs> Getting upset over time doesn't really seem to make people happy, it, but it can sort of trap you in a spiral. Whereas laughter, if you look at the world and you say, oh, well, that didn't work. Uh, you buy a brand new suit, you take a bite. I just happened to a friend of mine, he bought a brand new suit, beautiful. A couple thousand bucks, very expensive. He takes a bite of a hot dog and ketchup squirts all over the jacket. <laughs> the suit's about two hours old. He goes, oh, well, <laughs> there went 2,000 bucks. And, uh, I mean, you definitely could rage against the world and shake your fist at the sky, but it's not going to change anything more than laughing will. Okay, so, so what, what I've been sort of um, reading some Shakespeare and listening to some lectures on Shakespeare. And, and the sort of the Renaissance was the big conflict between um, classical values and Christian values. Um, and Christians don't, you know, Jesus never laughed. H how do you sort of see the Christian and, and, and classical sort of interpretations of laughter? Is, 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 is it sort of? What it's a good question. Uh, I mean, Jesus must have laughed. It's just not written down in the Bible. I mean, the guy must have laughed at some of it. Uh, Pilot laughs in the Bible. Do you know this? I didn't know so that. there's well, that, he doesn't say that he laughs, but there's a passage, a famous passage. Friedrich Nietzsche talks about this, and he used to be called the jesting Pilate. And so Pilate brings him up on trial and uh, says something to Jesus, and Jesus says the truth, and Pilate says, "Ah, I do the truth. What is the truth?" And so theologians sometimes say that's a very profound question. What is the truth? But traditionally, it was interpreted as a joke. Come on, man, what's the truth? Like, what is all this show trial that we're doing here? Um, as for, I mean, Christianity, what are a couple billion Christians in the world makes it tough to generalize. But uh, I mean, we have the, the road. Isn't, have you read the rain name of the roads? I think that, that, that has a big debate yes. on, 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 on uh, whether oh, humor is a Christian it. thing. Well, it's quite interesting. I haven't read the book in a very long time. It's about Aristotle's second book, The Lost Book of the Poetics, which is all about humor. And it's set in this, you know, detective fiction abbey in medieval times. Uh, in medieval times, people definitely laughed. They, um, and in Christian context, there was at least one thing I can think of. It was called the, in English, you would call it the, uh, the jackass feast. And people would bring donkeys and stuff into the church. And they would put a crown on the donkey and all that. And so the theologians would say, ah, ah you got to cut all this stuff out. But they called it the Festa Azenari, the jackass festival. And uh, so it's clear that some people didn't take it all that seriously. Um, but when it does come to very serious topics, right, you know, your eternal soul, you might wonder whether you should tell too many jokes about that. That would be my guess. Um, but I will say this, in the United States right now, there is an ups, uh, there's a new, I almost called it upstart, which is probably okay, but there's a startup um, 
satirical journal called the Babylon Bee. I think that's the name of the Babylon Bee. And it's absolutely hysterical. It's this made up uh, news sort of magazine, but it's all done from some Christian organization. So this group of Christians at least has a very good sense of humor. Okay. All right, well, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, let's open up the, the conversation. Um, anybody got any questions? Debbie? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. I sure can. I, I used to work as a lawyer and one of the charts I used to have in front of me was a quote which I think was from Cicero, which said, when you have no case, abuse the plaintiff. Could you, is that correct? And if so, could you tell me a bit more about that, please? Well, I can't source the quote right away, but it's certain, that is to say, I can't tell you where it comes from. Cicero wrote a lot, but it definitely is uh, in keeping with his style. Uh, and not just his style, but the style of the times. So it really was, their law cases really were an old boys network kind of thing. Um, and so absolutely the very last page of the book here is a good example of them doing that. So the opposing counsel in this case is this guy, Cato. Now Cicero and Cato knew each other for a long time. Um, and Cicero's guy is going to lose the case. So he begins ridiculing Stoicism. I mean, it would be like, because Cato was a Stoic, it would be like if your opponent is, if your opposing counsel is Christian, you start mocking Christianity. Say, oh, those miracles, come on. I mean, or if your opponent is, uh, the opposing counsel is Jewish, you start making fun of Judaism. And it's like really not very nice stuff to do, but uh, they definitely made it personal all the time. And so the quote sounds uh, true, even if it's not necessarily true in those words. There's a great Italian quote, Giordano Bruno, they burned him to the stake in Rome in Piazza, I in Campo dei Fiori, 400 years ago. And he famously said, uh, if it's not true, it's well invented. Right? If it's not true, it's a good story. <laughs> so I'd say that of the quote. So Wendy, I think you told me that you'd studied Latin. Do you use that in your speech writing work? Uh, yeah, I studied Latin for four years. Uh, I, I find uh, it helps you with the structure of language quite a bit. And uh, I'm really glad I did study it, but uh, I didn't study. Uh, I remember one poet, I think, was Cato a poet? It seems that his you're name. Catullus. I bet you're thinking of Catullus. Yes. Same time period, exact same time period. These, all, these people all knew each other. We translated yeah. a lot of his poetry and there was a great deal of humor in it. Yeah. yeah. I seem to remember. But yeah, I can't say that there's a direct connection, but I think there is a, somewhat of a connection with speech writing and Latin. Do you think your vocabulary is much larger than it would be without Latin? Uh, uh, yes, I do think it's larger and I understand the roots of words, yeah. where they came from. I, I had a very religious grandmother who uh, read me the Bible by the hour when I was a child, and that expanded my vocabulary a lot. <laughs> wow, I bet so, yeah. And, and, and Michael, did, did they sort of memorize, you know, commonplace books? Um, did, did they sort of uh, use them for memorizing jokes? You know, you'd have a a joke for a specific occasion. You know, these stand-up comedians, they they kind of have um, put-downs for hecklers and things like that. So they definitely had joke books. Uh, the problem is we don't have any of them from this time period in Rome, but uh, people, as Cicero refers to one in the book I translated here, and in other texts we have the characters refer to having these joke books. There is a single joke book from ancient Rome. It's all in Greek. because The eastern half of the Roman Empire was always Greek-speaking. And it's called the Philogelos or the Philogelos, the laughter addict. And uh, you can read it all. It's all online. The jokes are all still there. Um, some are funny, some not so. But uh, in terms of keying them to commonplaces in the, the way you just used it, I don't think they quite did it that way yet. It was more just lists of jokes. You do, however, um, at the end of each treatise in here, if you have a look, um, 
the jokes are all classified by sort of the underlying logic of the joke. And I went through and I inserted some, uh, I inserted some various um, numberings. For example, here's one B7, I called it. And it says, uh, also funny are remarks that make you think they're hiding a joke. So what is that? Well, he gives you an example. In this category belongs a well-known Sicilian joke. When a friend was wailing that his wife had hung herself from a fig tree, the Sicilian said, any chance I could get a few cuttings from that tree to plant? <laughs> and if you stop to think of it, he's like, there's not actually a joke in that remark, but it conjures up all these thoughts. They don't seem all that nice. Uh, and so it, it's quite interesting, right? So these are classified by the logic. There are um, there are others where you can twist the meanings. I mean, there must be 30 or 40 in each of their treatises. So each treatise ends with all these long lists of, um, if you want to write your own jokes, um, formulas you can use. And so sitcom writers use formulas exactly like this, although slightly different ones. And is Latin, you know, I study French and French is sort of a good, um, language for for wit, you know, it's it's sort of um, it, it sort of works. Is Latin um, a good language for humor? And how how difficult was it to translate? You know, because I think one of the interesting things about this book is you you put it into a very kind of uh, down with the kids sort of uh, contemporary language with your translation. How difficult was that? So translating jokes is far and away the hardest thing to translate. Uh, you probably know that from, everybody will know that from any foreign language, I would assume, whatever the language is. Um, and uh, as rhetoricians, you know this, right? You can either translate the exact words, you can translate the idea, what the Romans call the res versus the werbum. Uh, and so uh, I'm already, it's already proven polarizing. Some people love the translation, other people say, oh, this is horrible, he doesn't know what he's doing. So I, so I, I mean, I did do it on purpose, but to translate a joke literally, uh, I mean, I could give you some examples and I would translate it and you'd say, I don't have any idea what that means. So, right, because I'm translating word for word, uh, but you have to try and get the entire idea across and you have to find a way that makes it sound crisp like a punchline. Uh, and so I think there's no chance I'd ever get universal agreement on this. Um, but that's what I decided to do here. And if you think about this, I, I bet everybody on this call has probably studied some foreign language at some point. And in Europe, of course, you're exposed to foreign languages much, much more than we are here. Um, we're not even really aware that such things exist till we get to high school. Uh, but when you can understand jokes in a foreign language, that's usually a marker that you are becoming fluent in the language. So um, how has this book been received? How, how, how's it going? Um, I know you've written a book on drinking, um, which seems to go down very well. Um, how do your students, what do your students think of it? And, and have you been doing lots of these kind of media interviews and uh, um, are you getting a positive response? Oh, thank you. So uh, I'll just show you all. I have it sitting right. This is the book that came out just about one year ago, uh, How to Drink, A Classical Guide to the Art of Imbibing. Now, this book is awesome. It's translated from the world's first guide to managing alcohol 500 years ago, and it's hilarious. And it came out right as the entire world locked down so nobody had a chance to buy it. <laughs> so that was a truly unfortunate um, because, you know, there's a sales cycle for these things. And it's not that I'm going to get wealthy off the books, but I just like people to read it. It is fantastic. Um, that said, the, the, the publicity for that book, How to Drink, was off the charts. It was reviewed all around the world. Uh, there was a big write-up in the Daily Mail, which was sort of my the peak of my career. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was reviewed absolutely everywhere. And the reviews all loved it. But by and large, you know, these are books meant to be bought at a bookstore rather than ordered off the internet. Uh, people almost all love the translation. I did the same thing there, a very colloquial translation. This one has been very mixed, as I say, polarized. People either love it or they hate it. And they're saying so. Um, the publicity has not been anything like it was for the last book. Um, there's been a little bit. Uh, there's been much more interest in events like these, um, you know, groups getting together for chats. Um, but the newspapers have by and large ignored it. And um, a number of people who don't actually know Latin tell me the translation is terrible. So I say, well, I mean, <laughs> if 
if you don't really have a basis for assessing that, I'll just take that with a grain of salt. Um, and uh, so we will see, I'll have a chance to teach this in a course this fall. I do a course here called Introduction to Ancient Rome. And I try and change it up every year with something different. So I'm gonna have the students do a little module where they have to write their own jokes and sell us some product using humor. So we'll see if it works. Okay, okay. What's interesting though, I will say this. So this is the book that got humongous publicity, but nobody bought it. This book, apparently a lot of people are buying it, but nobody in the newspapers is talking about it. Very strange. Okay. And, and, and what's the original conception um, to, is it sort of, if, if, if you're a classic student, you know, you can, you can do this as part of your, um, you know, because there's a load of these books, aren't there? There's, there, there's a whole series of them. Yeah. Um, do, do your students sort of study these kind of things and um, will do it as part of, uh, uh, of their reading, you know, as part of a, a sort of, like I said, they'll, they'll translate, study the Latin and... and do no, they won't. So uh, these include the Latin, as you say. There's a whole series. This is uh, number 15 or 16. So the Latin is on this side here, to keep me honest, and the English over here. So you would think that these are meant for people like classic students, but they're absolutely not. They're meant for everybody. Uh, in fact, um, classics people are the one audience I'm not really especially interested in reaching with these books. Uh, I mean, in theory, if your Latin is good enough, you don't need these books. Um, we are trying to reach absolutely everybody else. And um, so the beauty of these books is that they do do that. We're trying to distill what they call ancient wisdom for, sounds quaint, but that's the idea, right? The best ideas that anybody from the ancient world has had and sort of polish them up like a nice little sparkling gem and present it to the world. Um, so I've been using some of these in class, but by and large, they probably will not be used in a classics classroom. Um, some people in classics, they only want you studying the original language uh, and they would not like having the English on the other side. Uh, that's not my own style, but I think that's probably the predominant style. Okay, okay. Well, um, I, I've enjoyed this chat very much. Um, there's a 25% discount um, from the Princeton University Press, which I, I circulated in the uh, email yesterday, um, if you want to buy a copy. And um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Michael, very much for the, this uh, very enlightening talk. And uh, I certainly uh, will, uh, I've certainly underlined and, uh, um, you know, kind of made notes for, for, for any future humorous um, speeches that, that I, I may um, make it, and thank you, you know, because it's quite difficult to connect the, 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 the world of speech writers with the world of classicists. Um, but, you know, maybe we do need to team up to evangelize for the fact that uh, classics is the answer. It's not, it's not something that uh, we need to forget or, or, you know, things we didn't get time to talk about how um, I, I was talking to a barrister and they don't use Latin in the law anymore. And you think, well, that impoverishes the law, it seems to me, you know, and there are so many ways to learn Latin now on the internet. You know, I, I recently bought the um, uh, Familia Romana. That's a superb textbook, probably the best textbook. Yeah, I, I, I paid 20 quid for this and, and um, it's great. It's really easy to read. And, and there's something uh, uplifting about re re recovering that, that those old words. And like, like um, Wendy was saying, you know, suddenly when you see a Latin word and its meaning, it, it sort of uncovers something of the meaning of your own language. Um, so I, I really do think that uh, if we were going to set up a school for speech writers, um, Latin would have to be on the curriculum. I love it. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for your time, Michael, and I wish you all the best with the book. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, folks. I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Bye. All right.